UN experts say Israel's deadly attacks on Janin may have been a war crime. The two-day operation has left 12 Palestinians dead and the refugee camp wrecked. Israel says they were rooting out terrorists, but the UN has called it barbaric. I'm Melinda Nusufora, and today's newsmaker is Israel's Janine Attacks. Israeli forces have concluded their largest scale military operation in the occupied West Bank in decades. At least 12 Palestinians were killed in the city of Jenin, around 100 were wounded and the refugee camp has been left largely in ruin. The Israeli military says the operation targeted weapons depots and infrastructure of militant factions in the camp. The incursion began with late night drone strikes followed by a sweep involving more than 1,000 Israeli troops. One Israeli soldier was killed. It sparked fury across the Arab world, but Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has warned there's more to come. We've just finished a, a comprehensive action against the terrorist enclave in Jenin. Jenin was to be a safe haven. It no longer is a safe haven. Uh, we uh, operated in a uh, uh, very uh, systemic way with large forces in one of the most uh, uh, concentrated and uh, dense areas on the planet. Uh, and we were able to attack the terrorists while uh, avoiding civilian casualties, whereas our enemies are committing a double war crime. They target civilians and they hide behind civilians. And we denied them the, uh, that possibility while avoiding civilian casualties. This is uh, a sign of, the, uh, of our next steps. This is just the first step. It's not uh, by no means uh, the, the last action that we will take. Multiple nations, as well as the Arab League, have strongly criticized the attacks on Janine. The United Nations has also expressed its concern, saying access to the injured must be assured. 3,000 people were uh, forced to, uh, to leave the camps uh, to try to protect themselves. So it's a horrific situation. It's a barbaric situation by the Israeli occupying forces in which they used uh, aircrafts, uh, they used a uh, large uh, number of uh, forces and infantries and mechanized units to attack this uh, small refugee uh, camp. And uh, they wanted to destroy the camp completely and they failed to do so, but they created a lot of uh, suffering for our people and they denied uh, ambulances and the Red Cross and the Red Crescent and uh, the uh, humanitarian agencies uh, to access the camp during uh, the last uh, 48 hours in order to provide humanitarian assistance and to uh, rescue the civilians. Palestinian militants paraded in Janine on Wednesday while angry crowds confronted senior Palestinian Authority officials, accusing them of weakness. The Authority protested against the Israeli operation, which it called a war crime, but was unable to do anything to stop it. At a funeral for 10 of the dead, thousands of mourners, including dozens of gunmen, confronted three senior Palestinian Authority leaders. The Palestinian Authority was set up 30 years ago after the Oslo Peace Accords, but it has been unable to assert itself against either Israel or the militant groups in Janine. Surveys show almost 80% of Palestinians want President Mahmoud Abbas to resign, but without any designated successor and a failure to hold elections for almost 20 years, it's unclear who would replace him. Meanwhile, refugees that remain in Janine have been left to clean up and come to terms with the destruction. We were surprised with a large number of army military. They entered the area, they entered the houses of our neighbours and our house. They evicted the people from their homes and positioned their snipers. The amount of destruction is devastating. We no longer have a sewage system, nor water. 
nor electricity, not phones. There is nothing left. He was between my arms. We could not save him. We could not treat him. He was shot in the neck. He kept bleeding and no one could reach him. He bled to death. This exploded in the arm of Ahmed Abu Jasser. He was injured and lying here, and this went off in his arm, and he was murdered. May he rest in peace. What happened in the Janin refugee camp the past two days was an organized criminal act. This is a terrorist state that used all its power and all the tools it has to destroy and terrorize a refugee camp in Janin. There are legitimate fears that the fighting could escalate. To discuss why this flare-up is happening now, we're joined from Ramallah by Noor Oden, a writer, political analyst and former spokesperson for the Palestinian government. Shai Franklin joins us from Denver in the United States. He's a senior fellow at the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Institute. And in London is Hugh Lovett, a senior policy fellow with the Middle East and North Africa program at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Thank you all for joining us here on The Newsmakers. Noor, let's start with you in Ramallah. How do the concerned parties stop this from escalating into a third intifada? Well, I, I have serious reservations about calling something a third or second intifada. The Palestinian people haven't stopped uh, protesting the, uh, the being ruled against their will by Israel. Uh, they haven't stopped resisting that occupation. And, and so what we see now is just an extension of what, what, what has been happening for over half a century. Israel trying to entrench its colonization of uh, Palestine to defend uh, that uh, regime of control and domination and Palestinians uh, resisting without a serious conversation about ending that Israeli regime of control, uh, about uh, having holding Israel accountable for its violations of international law. Uh, we will most certainly see more uh, of these uh, assaults on Janine and other Palestinian cities and the tensions which are at a boiling point uh, on the ground uh, could potentially boil over. Shai, history tells us that these kind of operations don't quash unrest. They foster more. Why hasn't Israel learnt from its own past? I don't think that either side is is acting in some kind of an abstract, rational uh, calculation. There are human influences, political rivalries on the Israeli side, on the Palestinian side. And the, the worse things get, the longer things go forward, the more that we see extremists like the current Israeli government and like some of the factions on the Palestinian side get strengthened whether it's in the West Bank or in Gaza or in Tel Aviv. And so uh, an Israeli strike, it may have a strategic or, or tactical advantage for a week or a month, but it also has a political advantage when Israelis are protesting against the legitimacy of the current Israeli government on the streets of Tel Aviv, uh, unprecedentedly, actually. Uh, and there's a crackdown on the Israeli side against Israelis. This is a, uh, it's convenient even if it has a tactical justification. So uh, in the 30 years since Oslo, really, Palestinians are, are, are behind where they were 30 years ago with all of the international uh, agreements and efforts and at certain points, Israeli governments that were sitting down with the Palestinian leadership. But there's been no meetings. There have been no meetings for years. And now there's a, a right-wing extremist right-wing, again, unprecedented right-wing government in Israel. So it's not a matter of learning or not learning. It's a matter of the conditions just getting worse and worse. Who do you think that uh, primarily the responsibility for that rests with? There hasn't been meetings for years. Is there a particular side letting them down? Or are they both equally responsible for the deterioration in situations? Whatever, whatever failures there are on the Palestinian side, the fact is that Israel is the, the major power. Israel controls the, the airspace literally and figuratively uh, around the West Bank and Gaza. So, uh, so at the end of the day, Israel is the only sovereign state in this equation. And so I think the responsibility uh, does rest primarily with Israel. If Israelis really wanted to do something, uh, they, they, they could have moved forward with Oslo. They could have elected different leadership. 
and maybe the situation would be better. Maybe the Palestinians still would have would have failed on their side, but but that would have been clearer. Right now, it's it's really when you become a sovereign state, you take on certain responsibilities. When you have a military occupation, you take on certain responsibilities, and then it's it's really up to you. Mm. You raised the point about uh, Netanyahu's current uh, domestic situation, and I'm going to circle back to that further on in our discussion. But first of all, let's bring Hugh in here for your current analysis. Hugh, are there any particular countries that you think are going to step in now to negotiate a temporary peace to ensure that this doesn't broaden out into a far-reaching escalation in violence? Certainly, there will be some countries that will, I'm sure, step up their engagement. Um, the United States has already uh, done a little bit over the past um, months uh, to try to, to de-escalate in partnership with uh, Egypt and Jordan. Um, Europe um, also, I think, has a lot that it could be doing, but it's been uh, absolutely absent um, for the past months. But I think it's different when we're actually talking about uh, achieving a sustainable de-escalation and a sustainable opening of political horizons. So yes, the US is, is uh, re-engaged to a certain extent, um, but that's not enough. That is not enough to reverse the, the really serious deterioration on the ground in terms of the deteriorating political and security situation. Um, you know, the US has broadly speaking given up on the Middle East peace process under the Biden administration. So too have the Europeans and so too are, are your most Arab capitals. So unless there's actually a much more sustained and long-term uh, investment of political capital, of international political political capital, to tackle the roots of the current escalation and the roots of uh, decades of uh, political impasse in uh, peace talks. Unless we have that sustained engagement, um, things will just continue to to get worse and worse, unfortunately. Mm. No. Uh... We heard Shai a little earlier discussing Netanyahu's current uh, domestic situation, so let's go to that now. He certainly faces a crisis at home. Was this operation in any way an attempt to distract his opponents and galvanise some support against a historic mutual enemy? Well, I think the, the attack on Jenin certainly served uh, this, this government. It served Netanyahu's purposes. He was facing a lot of pressure from uh, uh, elements within his government, which are even more extreme than he is. Um, Palestinian blood uh, translates into uh, votes for the right wing in Israel. That's just a, a very uh, um, um, brutal fact of life that we have seen time and time again. Every time there are Israeli elections, uh, uh, politicians compete to prove uh, just how powerful they are and how, uh, how they can crush the Palestinians, uh, how they've done it in the past and they can do it again. Um, we had heard uh, genocidal statements, really, from Israeli ministers before this assault on regime on, on Janine, um, and and uh, and so the attack served that tactical purpose, um, but it will be very short lived because the core uh, reason why there is resistance and why there are armed groups and why these some of these new armed groups don't even uh, adhere or affiliate with traditional. At Palestinian factions is because there is a complete breakdown in uh, uh, any sort of political process. There is no uh, horizon, there is no light at the end of the tunnel for Palestinians. You have a right-wing Israeli government that promises to crush the Palestinians, to crush their aspirations for statehood. You have a world, like you said, that is uh, you know, um, uh, losing interest and, and thinks that it can just throw money and um, and, and conditions of the Palestinians, and uh, uh, and it will manage the situation. I, I think that we are at a point where it is not manageable because of the rise of the right, because they feel emboldened, because you have settlers who believe they can go on a rampage to Palestinian villages and uh, with complete Im impunity. Um, and thus, all Palestinians feel that they're facing an existential threat. Mm. That sense of atmosphere will drive uh, a sense of need to uh, strike back, to respond, to defend yourself. And that's why there is popular support for these uh, young men who've taken up arms and, and people see them as defending the cities, even though, realistically speaking, there is absolutely no parity between uh, the, the, you know, what they have in terms of firepower in Israel, which is a military mm. superpower in the region. Indeed. Shai, what do you make? 
of the timing. We see Netanyahu beholden to the far right more so than ever before. Is that a worrying addition to what is already a tense situation? We typically see these kinds of uh, clashes during the summer months, uh, going back actually thousands of years. So, uh, so that by itself, this 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 incursion, this operation in Janine by itself, uh, might have been seen in a different context, say five years ago or ten years ago. But given what what Noor described, and and given what we see again on the streets of Tel Aviv, uh, this right wing government where. I mean, the, if this were the only operation, would be one thing. But when we have at settlers with uh, either the backing or the, the acquiescence or the uh, turning a blind eye of the Israeli authorities uh, rampaging against, against Palestinian villages repeatedly, these are Israeli civilians, armed Israeli civilians. Uh, when we see that, when we see the rhetoric, uh, then, then this fits into a context which is, is very disturbing. Will this lead to a third intifada? Uh, it's hard. It's hard to say. But the and the worse things get for Palestinians, and the more militant Israeli leaders get in their statements and in their actions, the less legitimacy uh, the mainstream moderate leadership on the Palestinian side has. And this has been consistent with Netanyahu's approach, not necessarily the Israeli approach, but certainly with Netany Netanyahu's approach. And as Noor said. Netanyahu really, or she alluded, Netanyahu is the least extreme member of his coalition. Mm. Uh, and this is a coalition that he chose. This is not that he is somehow under under some kind of, uh, he's not a hostage of his coalition. He created this coalition so that he could rule. And uh, on the American side, the we have a strong right-wing extremist bent on in his American politics as well. So it's going to be very difficult, even for a Democratic president, to uh, to take risks for peace between Israelis and Palestinians when there is, first of all, such tension, but mm. also when Netanyahu has made so clear that he is not willing to take those risks that uh, even some Israelis might be willing to take. Hugh, even though children and civilians were killed in these attacks, we haven't heard Western countries decry these actions. Uh, why? And what are the implications of their silence? It's a very good question. And it took the European Union uh, two days before it could come out with a statement uh, in response to what I think is the most serious escalation in violence in the West Bank since the Second Intifada. So that does say a lot. You know, clearly there's uh, specific dynamics in terms of U.S. Israeli relations, uh, how the U.S. is also changing its broader approach to the region as it seeks to pivot to Asia, um, also as it seeks to, to advance Israeli Arab normalization to the detriment of uh, Palestinian peace. Um, but I think the the change in European positioning is, I also find, fascinating at the moment. Um, I think a lot of this is being driven by the by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And this is, I think, shifting uh, how Europe views the world, views the Middle East. I think we're seeing a, a much more transactional European approach. Um, and unfortunately, a Europe which may still talk about uh, its own self-declared values of international law, but actually is much more selective in terms of where it applies these. And unfortunately, this is always the detriment of the Palestinians. Mm. And so, uh, like, just to finish on, when it comes to Europe's relation with Israel, Israel is now even more important to Europe because of the changing geopolitical landscape. Europe needs Israel for gas and for weapons. Um, Palestinians, unfortunately, have very little to offer Europe in this, uh, in this more, mm. uh, you know, globally competitive uh, regional and global yeah. order. Indeed, indeed. Noah, does the Palestinian Authority need to shoulder some of the responsibility here? It's facing its own crisis of legitimacy. If it were in a stronger position, would this, this, uh, the basis, this, you know, years of deterioration not have been able to take place? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, the, the legitimacy crisis that is facing the Palestinian political system uh, is very real and it's quite severe. But I'm not sure that even if we had a healthier political system, the situation on the ground would be different, I exactly because of what your two guests have been uh, discussing, the Israeli political dynamic and also uh, what is happening in Europe. You know, for Palestinians, when they saw the overwhelming international support following the invasion of Ukraine, 
there was optimism that, you know, the same standard would be applied. You can't possibly defend the people's right to uh, resistance and to liberate their land in one area and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, call them or pressure them into acquiescence in another. Well, of course, as we heard from Hugh, that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. The duplicity that we now see um, is undermining even the possibility of a Palestinian leader convincing ordinary Palestinians that the international order works or that it's relevant or that it's respectable for that matter. Um, I think for for our own sake as Palestinians, we there is a very urgent need to reimagine the political system, to redraw uh, the lines of, of uh, accountability internally and to um, have a political system that answers to the aspirations of Palestinians. But of course, that would be a departure from the playbook the international community expects mm. Palestinians to be playing out of. Indeed. And that risks uh, uh, sanctions and, 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 and other forms of pressures, uh, as we had seen before when Palestinians were punished for electing the wrong party. Mm. We've only got a few minutes left, but I've got a couple of questions I still want to address. So just briefly, Shai, let me ask you, does a weakened Palestinian authority or has a weakened Palestinian authority allowed armed groups in Janine to flourish, do you think? In a direct sense, yes, but more importantly, it, this has been, it, Netanyahu has consistently tried to to magnify the influence of Hamas. Uh, he has rewarded Hamas in many ways. And these incursions, these incursions strengthen the legitimacy of these opposition groups. And Hamas, in fact, is technically not an opposition group since they won the, the last election. Uh, but that was because Israel, partly because Israel had unilaterally withdrawn from Gaza and basically handed Gaza over to, to these extreme elements, it, it, releasing prisoners who are Hamas prisoners. Uh, that, that undercuts the Palestinian Authority. But before every meeting that Netanyahu would have with, with Mahmoud Abbas, he would, he would announce a new tranche of, of settlement unit. So, uh, so, so it, it, it's difficult to blame it's hard to say what is the, the causative factor here, but mm. uh, certainly, certainly the Israeli side uh, has not been uh, has not been doing what it what it needs to, and the the West also has not been doing what it needs to to lead to to, to press forward and to really create the conditions where there could be some legitimate Palestinian leadership. They're judged their legitimacy is is so much based on what happens extrinsically because of their situation, because they don't have that sovereign power and control. Mm. Hugh, Palestinians are, as we've seen, expressing their discontent for the Palestinian Authority in the wake of what's happened in Janine. The EU is one of the largest financial backers of the Authority. Should it be using its leverage to force change or renewal in the PA? And do you think even if it did, that would make any difference? Absolutely. Of course, there is an overarching context of uh, open-ended occupation which needs to be addressed. But certainly, as Norton was saying, being able to, to push forward with a uh, unified, representative Palestinian leadership uh, with a viable and strong institutions would increase Palestinian leverage. So yes, as the biggest donor to the PA, the EU does have an important role to play in encouraging those positive and necessary domestic changes in Palestine. And Noor, let's put the last question to you there in Ramallah. This situation uh, and the retaliation we have seen, Israel's operation, has it left the region less secure or more secure because they have, as Israel says, rid of Janine of terrorists? <laughs> you know, what Israel has achieved is uh, um, uniting uh, people, uniting the youth uh, in Janine uh, camp and across the occupied territory. Uh, the uh, sense amongst the, the wider Palestinian public is not one of defeat, but one of defiance. Um, and despite the destruction, as we've seen in previous Israeli raids and incursions, Palestinians will not um, allow such destruction to, um, to, to make them um, exhibit weakness or, or acquiescence to the occupation. So the, the atmosphere is combative, is, is quite tense, uh, precisely because Palestinians feel that they are under assault. There is no sense of security for Palestinians who live under occupation. Every detail of their life 
is controlled and it could be under assault depending on the decisions of the uh, Israeli patrol in their village or the Israeli military command or for political convenience um, at the government level. So that sense of security that we always hear about really more applies to the occupier, which I'm not sure is entitled to one uh, so long as it prolongs that occupation and defies its obligations. I think with this Israeli government at the helm, we will not see any kind of uh, letting in the in the clashes, in that sense of tension, and we will see more and more rounds uh, like Janine, and, and hopefully not worse, but mm. but you know potentially worse uh, so, um, clashes. Indeed, indeed, such a complex issue, and as you've all expressed, uh, no real easy solution, obviously which is why we continue to have to turn back to this topic. And I'm sure we will speak to you all again, uh, unfortunately, in the near future. Noor, Shai and Hugh, thank you for your expertise and your analysis here on The Newsmakers. And thank you for watching. Of course, you can follow us on Twitter and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Melinda Nusofora. We'll see you next time.